All right, let's take a look at section three, which has to do with gender and language. And before we start, it's important to remember that when we're saying, oh, I always forget to minimize this. When I'm saying gender, I'm not referring to, although sometimes the textbook is a little wishy-washy on this, not really referring to anything biological. It has to do with what society says that women should, that's acceptable for women to do, what society says is acceptable for men to do. So there is possibly some biology, but there's definitely a strong cultural component to this. So basically there are two schools of thought on how much, hmm, how great are the differences between the language that men use and the language that women use. And the first approach says there are significant differences. It is as if they are two different cultures. People like to use the John Gray uh, book, uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and say, honestly, it's like they're, they're two different species. It's very hard for them to communicate. Uh, Deborah Tannen is a, a big name in the field of uh, how men and women communicate differently. She's a big name in communication, and she has spent a lot of time talking about men and women and, and how differently they speak, starting from childhood. Okay. <clears throat> there is another, wait, and um, the other person, a communication scholar, Julia Wood, there's a chart on page 157 that is based on some of the work that she's done that shows differences in feminine and masculine communication practices. Okay, so these are written as generalizations, not as hard and fast, but they show this is a feminine style and a masculine style. Uh, women converse to maintain relationships, men converse to establish control. Uh, women create a climate of equality, men create a sense of power and status. Okay, so you can, you can take a look at this. I'd like you to, to think about it and be thinking about is this true in your experience? And if you say, yeah, but, it's important to pay attention to those buts. Even though I said you shouldn't say that, pay attention to exceptions because they tend to be the more interesting pieces of information we can look at. The second approach says, sure, there are differences, but they are minor differences that really only 1% of variance in communication behavior comes from sex differences. That, um, and we'll, we'll look at what these differences might be due to in another slide. But I think this is very interesting uh, that the idea, okay, uh, where is this? Uh, researchers asked men and women to describe a health-related episode in their lives. Analysis of the transcripts revealed that women used slightly more intense adverbs and personal pronouns than men did. However, participants who read the transcripts, uh, th these transcripts were, they, they, they removed any, you know, anything that would indicate whether it was a man or a woman. So participants who read the transcripts were largely unable to identify the speaker's gender. The same researchers then asked men, women, and transgender women to describe a painting. Uh, studied closely, the transgender woman's word choice were slightly more similar to men than to women, but again, most people could not distinguish between them on the basis of word choice. So what they're saying is, yeah, when you, when you remove, how would I say this? When you look at just the words and you're not connecting them with the person, you're less likely to say, oh, well, that's what a woman would say. Oh, well, that's what a man would say. Okay. Uh, the, so th this is the one, instead of saying men are from Mars, women are from Venus, it's more like um, men are from North Dakota, women are from South Dakota. But one of the things they found was women are not more talkative than men. There are definitely some women who are, but overall it's it's fairly equal. So I have put in Blackboard a video. It's relatively short. It's very humorous. Take it with a grain of salt. It's called The Man's Later, but it does give us some insight on how there might be some culturally approved differences in how men and women 
speak. So let's let's say that that approach number two that there really are minor differences that the the differences are not really due to gender. Well, what could they be due to? Aha! I'm glad you asked that. So <clears throat> the two big ones: occupation and power. You know. Uh, status kind of okay so one of the things they've noticed is that um, male and female athletes communicate in similar ways and male daycare teachers speech to their students resembles the language of female teachers more closely than it resembles the language of fathers at home so what they're saying is in the in this daycare situation it it's not the gender that determines how the people will speak, but the fact that they are teachers. Uh, female farm operators working in a male dominated world reproduce the masculinity that spells success for their male counterpart parts. So they will swear, they will uh, talk tough as nails. Okay. And no big surprise, power. So. <clears throat> One of the things we know that it, uh, if you were to look at people within an organization, the the people who have more power, let, let, um, let's just look at like a place like Tungsis, someone who is the CEO or the president and the people who are the, the deans probably will speak much more similarly to each other, whether they're male or female, than they will if they're, when, then they, oh my gosh, I tripped over my own my own words here and the, <laughs> the one on language. So the people who are in the upper echelon of power in the organization sound much more like each other than they do people who are lower down. Okay, does that make sense to you? Okay, so <clears throat> when I'm looking at this, checking your understanding, think about, according to what the book says, how does gender influence the language used in interpersonal relationships? You can look at the work that Deborah Tannen has done, or as the textbook says, the work that Julia Woods has done. Okay. I'm sorry, there's no S on her name. Julia Wood. All right. So then what? how do factors other than gender influence the language that we use in interpersonal relationships? Okay, so this is kind of like, can you remember what was said in the chapter? And most interesting, based on your experience, what do you think is the extent of gender on language use? So I'm looking at that and I might say, well, you know, uh, uh, I had read somewhere that when men and women are having a conversation, uh, women use many more things like, aha, uh -huh, go on, and then to keep the conversation going. And, and men are much more likely to be quiet. So here's the scenario. John comes home and says to Mary, I ran into uh, Bill at the store and he said that he and Joan are gonna have a party uh, next week and they've invited us. And meanwhile, as he's talking, his wife is saying, aha, uh -huh, okay. All right, a week goes by and, you know, Friday night and what was the name I said? Bill says to Mary, are you ready to go? And she says, what are you talking about? And he says, you said you wanted to go to the party. She said, no, I didn't. I was just saying, aha, uh -huh, okay, like keep going. All right, same scenario, but Bill's at home and Mary comes home and she says, I ran into Joan at the store. She and whatever I said her husband's name was, <laughs> are having a party on Friday and they've asked us to come. And Bill says absolutely nothing. Okay, so on Friday, Bill says to Mary, aren't you ready? And she says, what are you talking about? And he says, the party. And she said, but you didn't say anything. Okay, now to me, this is very true because this is exactly what happens with my husband and I. He is a, a not giving any kind of feedback kind of person. Is it because he's male? Is it because he grew up in a different culture? I don't know. So... I, I, I can be persuaded either way on this one. So anyways, this section three is a very short one. And so we will wrap up in the next section.